Another aspect of, like, how do you love the battle for integration? First reason is, is this helps you see God better. But related to that, it helps you see God's plan better. How does, okay, here's what God chose. Why would he do that? And why did he construct it this way? Rather than some other way, like, like why doesn't he just bean things like they did in the sitcom Bewitched? And it just works. Okay? Because the answer has to be, has to, that it's better to have it be hard than to have it just work. And we can all identify with that answer in some respects. Because we get bored if things are too easy. But, you know, God's, as it were, bandwidth of deciding too easy, too hard, and what hard ought to be is so much wider than ours that it's kind of like, well, how could this be? So what if, and I, this is really speculation now, but it makes sense, that's why I'm going to say it. What if the eternal state, and I've said this before, is to a certain extent structurally and as it were visibly officially something of a higher plane replay of life down here in other words we go through our life down here and it's a lot of hassle and a lot of failure and a lot of things go wrong and yada 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 and the paramount thing that's, that we know is happening is that God's will is not being done. And we have that, you know, prayer, that the so-called Lord's Prayer, but it's really not the Lord's Prayer. Um, it's the disciples' prayer. Um, you know, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, well, what is the answer to that question? What would have been the movie of the world, of your life, of somebody else's life, if God's will had been done on earth as it was in heaven? What if that's the eternal state, where God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven, in the new Jerusalem, you know, the new earth, the new universe, blah de blah Because the whole universe that we call ours now is going to just blow up. My pastor was trying to figure out if Peter was talking about it in terms of fusion or fission. It's in Second Peter 3. Um, and it, just around, just before um, Second Peter 3.11, which is one of my favorite verses. What sort of persons must we become in a dedicated to God lifestyle? Greek word there is huparkane. And it means that the ruler is the most ruled. Hooper means under, and arcane means rule. So ruling under, under ruled. See, it's a, it's a it's a conceptual palindrome. Okay, is it fusion or is it fission that starts the new universe out of the embers of the old, which becomes hell? That's basically what Peter's saying there. And my pastor said, you know, given the structure of the universe and everything like that looks like Earth, especially with its hollow core, is ground zero. So something's going to happen to blow up the Earth. And we'll all survive it, of course, because we got new bodies. And so do the people who are destined for hell. And they're all going to go just into the lake of fire, which will be the name for the old universe that is now one great big fireball. Which means that they're not actually burning, okay? But it ain't going to be comfortable. And the new universe is a new earth, a new Jerusalem, new heavens, blah de blah You know, that that is talked about in, what is it, Revelation 21. Is that going to end up being on... Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, coming to fruition as a sort of lifelong Bible class replaying well what would it have been in your life 
had God's will been done in your life on earth. Now obviously the full details of your life on earth are not replicated because you're no longer in the same body for one thing. But there will be essential as it were you'll have your memories there will be essential structures and I don't know what you want to call it lifestyles that we'll all have in the eternal state that will have obviously some kind of root in our original life down here It'll probably be very ironic probably be very humorous definitely very tailored and you on the inside of your soul will see the connections and maybe to some extent you're supposed to portray those connections and I've speculated about that before what if the kingdoms of the new universe in the eternal state have at least sections within each of the kingdoms that are kind of like renaissance fairs about what life was like down here at a given time uh, in a given segment of time with the people who actually lived during that time playing the roles and portraying, playing out what would have been the history or what was the history versus what would have been the history if God's will had been obeyed. Because, you know, in, in Greek drama they did stuff like that. And they did them in quadrilogies. You know, we call them series. You know, mini-series. And it's usually four. And in Greek drama, it was, it was three comedies and a tragedy. Or three tragedies and a comedy. And the word comedy in Greek drama doesn't mean ha-ha. It means happy ending. So, is it, let's pretend, I, I mean, I don't know your, your name, because I don't know who's listening. So I'm going to use my own, but it, replace my name with yours, okay? I'm a king. I'm King Branham. In my kingdom, there will be a certain section of the real estate in my kingdom devoted to these plays. And of course, they're going to have all kinds of special effects because it's going to be the reality. And people will come from miles around to watch these plays of uh, what had been by the real people who lived then and what could have been by the real people who lived then. And maybe they'll have like traveling actors that go on a circuit around all the kingdoms of the universe, you know, portraying specific events like assuming, and I really hope this is true, but it probably isn't, assuming Julius Caesar was saved then he gets to be pretend part of the traveling group to portray what his life was like as it actually happened versus what God wanted to happen but at least he got saved you know so that would be the comedy you know the happy ending of one of the, the plays probably the last of the four because he dies you know on the Ides of March something like that or maybe you know one of the popes because, you know, he shouldn't have been Catholic. He should have outlawed Catholicism. He should have said, this is a joke. He could have said that. That would have been God's will for his life. You know, once he at least got there, if not before. And he said, you know, this is what I did. And he goes through all the motions of what he did. And he's the real guy. That's his real life. And so, of course, he's sort of burlesquing himself. But we'll all like doing that. Because we'll be so pleased with God's real value and will. That we'll want to boast in our weaknesses like Paul does. And what was it? What was it? Second Corinthians 12. Second Corinthians 12. Verses 9 and 10. Okay. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. That verse. Anyway, so maybe that's what they do. Is they have those little acting troops that are, you know, of various famous people in history who, you know, make circuits around the universe and then they come and they play in your town. Or you'll have some of those people living in your kingdom and you put them in some part of your kingdom 
You know, because it'd be a permanent thing. Just like the Renaissance Fair is a permanent thing. And unlike the Renaissance Fair, which unhappily only, you know, comes to play every couple of years and for a few months, this one will be ongoing. So that when you're on your vacation from whatever job you're given in the eternal state, then, oh, let's go, let, honey, let's go spend, you know, two weeks down at the, the, the history fair. And when I say, honey, I mean, I don't know, is God going to put a husband and wife who want to still be together, together, but they're not really husband and wife anymore, but they're still close in their souls? So then, do they stay companions? Maybe. Are we free to choose who our companions are? Are we free to say, well, I want to be in this kingdom, so I'm moving it, uh, you know, out of the kingdom I'm assigned to and going to move into another kingdom? Maybe. Oh, he just threw that at me. God, I have not seen nor ear heard what God has prepared for those who love him. That's concatenating the end of Romans 8 and um, the refrain in, I, I think it's Isaiah. It might be Jeremiah. Versus, <laughs> oh, you had to say that. Versus, hearing they don't hear, seeing they don't see, which is definitely Isaiah. I want to say it's 14. Ooh, blau blau, B I L A U, B I L A U W, in the transliteration of the Hebrew. I can't see the Hebrew letters in front of me right now. Okay, but it's drunken speech. Blau blau blau. Line on line, precept on precept is the verse in English. And it's just before that and just after that and part of that same verse. Because line on line, precept on precept is what they should be doing, but they're instead doing the drunken speech thing, so it's a handy way, he's so clever, to tie to what I just said. I had to think through why he gave me that verse. So that's why. All right, anyway. So that could be, you know, how he does it. In other words, a large part of the way we live our outer life in the eternal state is sort of like replaying life stories that were true down here versus God's meaning for those stories and or what if God's will had been obeyed, what would have been the outcome? You know, what if? The what ifs. Now, my pastor was really big on speculating that there was like this museum where if you didn't grow to kingship, because he was real big on the kingship thing, if you didn't grow to kingship and die mature, because he was always telling us about, you know, Second Timothy 4, 7, and 8, Paul being crowned, okay? A lot of what I say about the kingship, I actually, you know, theme taught. And I'm elaborating on it or thinking out loud about what it means. All right. He was speculating that there's this, what he called the escrow, because he didn't understand some things about law that well, but he understood well enough to know God had a will, willed the highest and best for your life. That's put into the book of life. That's already there. And the question is, is it going to be blotted out? See, there's two kinds of blot outs, katalepo in the Greek. You can be blotted out of the book of life entirely because you never believe in Christ, because you're there at birth. That's why if you die before reaching the age of accountability, doom, you're in heaven. Okay. But the second kind of blot out is talked about in Revelation 2 and 3, where your rewards, your, as it were, God's will for your kingship, is instead blotted out, but you yourself are still saved. And of course, Paul was talking about that too. I, sorry, he's giving me a lot of verses really fast. First Corinthians two, okay, um, where he, he 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 himself shall escape yet through fire. 
the idea being is that the fire burnt up all of your works and you didn't learn any Bible so you have no gold, silver, precious stones of Bible in your head so you escape and you're alive but you got nothing on top of your salvation okay so what my pastor was doing he explained all that is he was saying well there's he, he speculated there is some kind of like museum memorial museum where you can, as he would put it, go and visit God's highest and best for you, what it would have been like. Kind of like a diorama. Go look up that word. D-I-O-R-A-M-A. -A. It was a way of um, presenting things in the 1950s. Very popular um, attraction, like a, an entertainment attraction, like Disneyland. Okay. So, like in a diorama, so you could go visit what my pastor would call your escrow blessings, what God would have given you if you had matured. And see the, mo the memorial, as he put it, to lost opportunity. Is that true? Well, then maybe there's a place like that that you can go, we can all go visit. Because obviously the purpose for all of this is to know God better. God expressing himself, all that he had in mind, I have not seen, there you go, I have not, he just threw this at me again, I have not seen or ear heard what God has prepared for those who are the called according to his purpose. Now he just mixed Roman, the end of Romans there. R Romans 8.28 with it. So the, the highest and best that God will working everything together for good is obviously one track that history could have followed, partly or wholly, that would be very instructive and entertaining and enjoyable to know. And it would definitely be an important thing for the, the paparazzi to learn. Uh, that's not really the right word. For the hoi polloi, for the masses. The people who never learned and lived on Bible, they can't appreciate the higher stuff so they can go look at the goodies that they could have had under him and learn that way. Because basically most of the human race is hardwiring themselves to process information through goodies. They're not learning how to think in terms of principle. They're not learning how to think in terms of doctrine. So the stuff that's happening to me right now, I'm not sure it might be happening to them, but very rarely. Because your mind has to be built up in principle before you can just throw. I mean, I, I don't even know how to explain this to you. He just throws like... I don't even, he throws the idea of the verse at me with just like very few words. And I know immediately what he means. Why? Because I've been so trained in scripture. And the reason why I guess this is being demonstrated to you is that it's supposed to happen to you. And that, because it happened to Christ, Matthew 4, 4, Satan throws at him the image of bread. And instead of thinking of bread and therefore turning the stones into bread, he thinks of the Bible instead. Immediately, the association is ironclad, instinctive, knee-jerk, just like when you hit your knee. If you hit your knee just under the knee, your your leg will kick up. Doctrinal instinct got doctrinal reaction. Okay? It's building doctrinal reactions. Okay, but the, p until you have enough doctrine in you, that doesn't happen. It takes time. You have to have a, a lot of it there. It's like practicing piano. It's a fluency issue. It's like learning a language, practicing piano, learning how to play basketball, learning to be good even at poker or cards. There's a fluency in your job. The first day you're on a job you've never had before. You're awkward. Everything's hard to remember. You're slow. Once you've been on that job for a year, you don't even have to think about it. It's like brushing your teeth. It's that kind of thing. Okay? So, the hoi polloi are going to need the diorama showing them what they lost. Not just them, I mean, it's going to be public. Everything is public. Everything I've ever done is going to be public. Everything you've ever done is going to be public. 
It's a question of whether it's going to be public as king, and then you're going to marshal together your own past. For the sake of your kingdom, who needs to know that past? Because that's how they're going to learn him, through your past. Or whether you're just going to be part of the masses and your past is just so much like everybody else's past. And then you go to the diorama and we all look at it and you're going to the diorama and I'm going to the diorama with you and we got ten others going with us and we all go visit our own what a, what it could have been. And we all are, yep, God is just, God is just. Oh, look how beautiful this could have been. See how great and gorgeous he is. And that's the extent of our understanding. And we all commiserate together in a way. We're not unhappy, but, you know, we obviously wish that we had grown up. And that's as far as it goes. And we'll all know the intimate details of each other's lives. But we're not using them to be nosy or gossipy. We're using it to know God. Because we're so small. We have to use every little bit, every bit of the day, in order to get a little bit of learning about Him. Because we're so tiny. Whereas the king, and you could be one, is getting whole books of information within a nanosecond. And that'll happen to you down here, too. That one I'm sure of. That statement I'm sure of. It's not speculation. Because it happens to me all the time. Not, well, not quite that, uh, that much, but definitely that often, especially when I'm talking to you in these audios. I need it to happen when I'm doing something else, or I'm less connected to him. Right now I'm thinking toward him and talking about him, and he really wants certain things to get across, so he just interrupts. And sometimes he does that when I'm washing the dishes, or watching a movie, or writing an email. But I need to be paying more attention to him. Off audio. And you can do the same thing too. God, remind me. God, throw things at me when you want. Just ask him. He will. And when you're mature, because it's like the cross. This is exactly what happened on the cross. God threw all of our sins into Christ's head. The knowledge of them. The knowledge. It's the only knowledge he didn't have. So imagine all that knowledge is hitting you. Like when I talk on these audios, everybody always tells me, Oh, you talk too fast. It's too much information. I have to listen to it over and over. I'm sorry. I have to talk fast because I'm going to forget if I don't talk fast. Yes, it's a lot of information and my eyes glaze over too. Well, okay. Too much information. Zoom! Sixteen different pieces of Bible that all fit together in your head and you know exactly what they mean. But it happened so fast, you couldn't exactly tell anybody how it happened. Or if you know how it happened, and I've done this, you try to write it out, and you'll be writing for the next six weeks. But you understood it in six nanoseconds. That's your future. Because that's how divine omnipotence and omniscience work together. Everything at once. So that's a different kind of battle for integration that obviously one will want. Because, oh, there's there's just so much satisfaction in understanding. Even if it's not pleasant what you know. You know. There's, I don't know how to explain it. There's a great deal of satisfaction in just understanding. This is what it is. I know. It's, it's, it's a relief. A lot of people are afraid to know things. I don't know why. I'm never comfortable until I know. And once I know, I have to be able to say, well, how do I know that this is true? Okay, well that's a battle for integration, and it's very satisfying. So there's another reason to love it. So you love it because you get to know him, you love it because you get to see why he chose what he chose, you love it because you get to see how he plays a thing, and how he accomplishes his goal, the process, 
And you love it because you come to understand. And that's why it ought to go on forever. Because all these poor people are going to die without doctrine because they don't want it down here. Once they're dead, they're going to want it, but they'll be so small, they can only get little triplets at a time. Triplet today, doctrine. <gasps> oh, roof. Triplet tomorrow, doctrine. Oh, roof. It breaks your heart. They'll never, well, I don't know about never, but it'll take a long time before they're fluent. Even though we're all going to be light years higher in abilities and competence and beauty and all the rest of it once we're dead. Because he's infinite. So the greatest of us are going to be, I can't, I have not, he just threw it at me. I had not seen or ear heard the, what God has prepared for those who love him. God is, no, he changed it. What God has prepared in Christ Jesus. He changed it just now. He's concatenating verses again. Okay, but God is prepared in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus is a refrain all throughout the New Testament. So we're going to be light years higher. But the differential between the top class and the bottom class is astonishing. Now, another thing which was the impetus for this audio is the battle for integration to love it is to see how it helps every plane of society society is going to be hierarchical because people have chosen to be at different levels okay and to see how something at the top actually benefits every class below it is also a satisfaction God's satisfaction is seeing this happen to us he's satisfied when the lowest of us like what was that about where angels long to look and the other verse where angels when even the, anybody believes in Christ down here the angels all cheer that was in Peter the angels cheering I think is in Paul somewhere okay if the angels are cheering how much more gone I snatched this brand from the fire you were lost but now you're found Jesus said Sweep around to find you lost one coin and the other 99 coins you just forget about to find the one. You lost the sheep and the other 99 you leave on the hill to go find the one you lost. It's that kind of pleasure. And we all have experienced that. You know, I've got 19 Windows computers. And I've now created something like, I don't know, 10. I mean, I have more than that, but as far as usable, 10 Linux distributions. And it should be Linux, not Linux, because it's L-I-N, single, U-X. So, you know, when one of my machines goes bad, even though I have all these other ones, suddenly the one that goes bad is my dearest and I'll coddle it and I'll do all kinds of things to it. You know, two of the machines right now are having problems. Actually, three of them. And so now they get more attention. Doesn't mean I don't love the other machines. Okay, there are billions of us. He doesn't love any of us any less. But when, we, when we're, like, behind it, we're retarded, we're stuck, and we get free on some topic oh man there's joy in heaven so then there'll be joy in you when one of your kingdom subjects is finally having a breakthrough and for you know them it's two coppers but that's a lot for them and you'll be overjoyed and want to break out the champagne 
That's a reason to want to battle for integration. That's a reason to love it. All the benefit you see your kingdom getting. Yere, thank you, Daddy. Just threw that at me. Yere, izba, betato yatstik, tzadikadila rabim. Well, oh, one of them? Who is bol? That's the, the last part of Isaiah 53 11, Hebrew. Okay, yire, he will see. Izba, he will be satisfied. While he's on the cross, he saw the benefit of what was happening to him, to us. My pastor made a big stink about that. He kept on saying, you know, in the Sunday altar calls, Christ had you personally in mind on the cross. Yeah, there you go. That's the verse. He will see. He will be satisfied. But dato yatzdik, by means of his truth knowledge, he makes righteous. Tzadik abdila rabim, the righteous slave son. For the people. What well, awona tam? And our twisting sins? Who is bold? He took on. Carried. Well, there's a satisfaction there. That's Hebrews 12 too. Who for the translated joy set before him? My pastor preferred the term exhibited happiness. He endured the cross. Disregarding is the way it should be translated. Disregarding the shame. Well, yeah, you disregard the shame if you're seeing something that makes it worthwhile to you. So God is essentially promising, look, this is what it's like for me to be God. I chose this. These are some of the satisfactions. So why would I want to have things be easy? Oh, thank you. Wow. He just threw at me a line. I think it's from The Tempest in Shakespeare. If after... what? How does that go? If after such tempests come such calms, then blow wind crack your cheeks. I'm not sure that's from The Tempest. That might be from King Lear. But that th that's the verse. Then blow wind, crack your cheeks. Just go Google on it. You'll know what Shakespeare play it is. If after the tempest comes such calms, then blow wind, crack your cheeks. In other words, fine. If I'm going to get this much happiness out of, you know, a storm, then storm away, please. That's what he's saying. It's amazing he would quote Shakespeare. I'm sure there's a Bible verse I must not review. He must want to use the Shakespeare right now. Now think that over. Talk to him. Obviously he's been interrupting me, so there's some truth to what I'm saying here. So you talk to him. And ask him for, you know, Bible verses. Peace out.